Okay, let's pray together. Lord God, thank you so much. Thanks a lot that uh, you loved us and you sacrificed your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus, for us to forgive all our sins and to give us life eternal. Lord, because of that good news, we are here again together to learn more about you, to learn your word, and to receive from you the grace that the world cannot give. Lord, be with us, pour your sp spiritual blessing upon our heart and mind so that whatever we discussed in Christ Jesus, make those things become ours so that we change every day in conformity with our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray particularly for these students of yours. They live in very adverse circumstances, but in spite of these old difficulties, because of your uh, surpassing grace, they may be able to overcome all the hardship and come up as a victor in the Lord. Lord, I want them to be very influential people in your eyes. Whoever come to them will be changed in the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. For that purpose, equip these students of yours with your living word and the uh, uh, worldly knowledge also, so that through their teaching, through their preaching, through their evangelism, the world may get closer to you in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In all this I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> um, all right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, this is an apologetic course. Um, we already covered a little bit what that word means. Don't take it very in a difficult way. Apologetics is simply defending your faith and uh, also sharing your uh, of faith with other people, particularly uh, against people who attack Christianity, protect the gospel, or we have to equip ourselves to defend our faith uh, before them. Uh, that is the uh, apology. So, in a broad terms, apology is everything what the whole Bible teaches. That is, you know, the apologetic uh, subject. Okay, today we will begin uh, apology in the history of redemption you know, throughout the uh, historical uh, context, how this apologetics is used, has been used. If apologetics is at least getting oneself off of charge, that is a defense, but at most, a proclamation, persuasion of the gospel, 
then the scripture has a great deal to say about how to argue apologetically. Much of the ministry of Jesus couched in terms of apologetics. When Jesus deal with uh, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and old Jewish people, what he said is always what? You know, what he said is the, the content of the gospel. That is the content of our apologetics. The opposition against Jesus also serves as a pattern for how many opposing the Christian viewpoint have attacked it. If we know the nature of the gospel as a two-way, it is not just a neutral. You all know, right? Either for those who believe in the gospel, it's a what? Living message. For those who oppose the gospel, it's a what? It's a stench of death. It is the aroma of death. Yeah, so the gospel is a peculiar in the sense that, you know, somebody hear it, they have no option but to express themselves either for it or against it. You know, nobody can remain neutral in front of the gospel. See? Yeah, so whoever do not believe in the gospel, of course, then they will uh, attack it. Why? Because they feel offended when they hear the word of the gospel. So, Simeon in the temple, Luke chapter 2, verse 24, he says, this child destined to cause the rise and fall of many, a sign to be spoken against by many. One of the identifying features of the Messiah, he will cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. Of course, many will rise as well. The Gentiles who become the Israel of God in the age of the church. Christ provokes thoughts, reveals hearts. Some hate him. Some are full of fear etc. He also defends those who believe in him, however. Yeah, so when you read the Bible carefully, then what? Always Christ, Jesus provokes thoughts and reveals hearts. He does not deal with people superficially. Whatever he says, just one word, then what? Either it provokes anger or it, uh, it stirs the hearer's heart and mind so that they follow Jesus and they believe in Jesus. Either way, right? Yeah, so we have an imitation. Uh, we, we have to imitate Jesus in our saying too. In our sharing the gospel, always what? We talk like Jesus Christ. Either what we say provoke anger or, you know, rebellion, or we stir people's heart, make them believe that Jesus is the Christ. All right? Yeah, so if we see the gospel this way, then we have to realize nowadays the preaching, you know, in general, or Bible uh, study teaching in general is somehow kind of distorted. It's not the desirable way to teach. Why? Because it doesn't have the spiritual power. That is why I just keep saying, watch out so that you may not dilute the, the, the gospel. No, we conscientiously or even unconsciously, we dilute, tend to dilute the content of the gospel. Why? Because we kind of, we are fearful to offend people's heart. 
But that is not the right way. Jesus always provokes thoughts and reveals heart. Therefore, some hate him, and some are full of fear, etc. He also defends those who believe in him, however. He defends you and me because we are his believers. Paul often dragged before authorities. Opposition not always a matter of misunderstanding or reluctance. God seems to ordain this. Error and hostility are often right there next to the proclamation of the truth. Yeah, because people are offended, they are bound to distort the content of the gospel. That's why, you know, so many are uh, atheistic atheists nowadays. You know, we do not even uh, say bad things uh, against them. But whenever we share the gospel, the sharing gospel itself is offensive to them because it, it exposes their sinfulness, exposes their rebelliousness against God. And they just uh, immediately know that, even though they suppress the truth. That is what the Romans chapter 1 teaches, right? So this calls for an argument, a defense. Paul says the gospel came to the Thessalonians with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. First Thessalonians 1.5. What the first Thessalonians 1.5 says, God didn't come to you, not just with words, but he came to you and me, what? with the power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Okay, let me ask you guys. Whenever you read the Bible, it comes, that word of God comes to you with the Holy Spirit, with deep conviction, and with power, then God will use you in an amazing way. Why? Because that is what the word of God is all about. Corinthians, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade people with reverence. That's the second Corinthians 5.11. What is it? You know, our weapon is not what worldly kind of a weapon. We do not engage in argument, in apologetics, not with just the intellectual power or uh, reasoning, but with the spiritual power, right? And we try, we captive every thought of unbelievers by this spiritual power. Of course, we use our intellect, you know, including you and me, we tend to uh, separate between spiritual things and intellectual things because our tendency is that the more intellectual, the less we become spiritual because that is our tendency. But what the Bible teaches is not that. You can be both intellectual and spiritual, you know? What is faith? Some people, if they are full of faith, then they many, many of them think it becomes illogical because faith is against the reasoning. No, 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 that's 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 not right. What about you know Apostle Paul, for example? He's one of the most preacher person. But he's also one of the most intellectual person. Why? He's because his intellectual capacity has been regenerated spiritually. The same thing. You and me, we have to be a very reasonable person. But our reasons cannot stand alone without, you know, Holy Spirit. Our reason has to be also regenerated 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.11 says. I think the point he's trying to make here is fear of God coupled with persuasion. Yeah, so when you preach the gospel, preach your sermon, or when you uh, teach uh, the gospel, a Bible study, or whatever, always, what is with persuasion? You know, if it is not reasonable, if it is not logical, then it cannot be persuasive. Right? Yeah, so even though we are persuasive, still we are not using our intellectual capacity only, no. It's a fear of God that is with. When you are aroused, the feeling of fear of God, when you receive God's grace, that's when we fear of God, right? So always fear of God coupled with persuasion is not coercion. Coercion is already it's kind of a humanistic manipulation including in life, right? Many in the world today seem to fear that anyone who has conviction of truth will be coercive, subversive, or even violent in trying to bring them to accept our position. This is what the uh, humanistic people always attack Christianity. Why Christianity insists there is only one truth in Christianity in Jesus Christ alone. And then they, they try to attack, you know, if you take that position, then they should be coercive. They should be subversive. Yeah, so we have to repent. If we are trying to be coercive or try to, you know, force other people to believe in Jesus because that's what uh, Muslims do, you know? What about Muslims' uh, uh, evangelism? They have in the war on the in, on the one hand, they have this sword. On the other hand, they have this Korah. You know, either you you take Korah or you die. No, no, Christianity is completely different. Christianity is, uh, you know, uh, uh, it it is the truth. I keep emphasizing. If Jesus says, I am the truth, what does that imply? Outside of Jesus, Jesus Christ, there's no truth. Okay, if you say that without diluting that, then of course your remark is bound to provoke many, many people against you because you're as if you're saying that Unless you believe in Jesus, then you don't know nothing about the truth. But that is true. That's what the Bible says. You know, once they, people come to know that Jesus is a, not only a human being, but he's God becoming man, then of course there is no truth outside of God. It is very natural. But because they don't believe, you know, they think it's coercive or a subversive, even violent, right? So, yeah, we try to learn, even though we always proclaim the exclusiveness of the gospel, we proclaim it with love, with persuasion, with reasoning. That is what this apologetics all about, all right? So, in contrast to this, we are called to be persuasive. We are called to be, we are called to be offensive. Go on the offense in this task. But our weapons are spiritual, not physical. This implies intellectual arguments have a spiritual dimension. For example, take every thought captive. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. Perhaps a good way of saying this is very important. That's why I you know, underlined this this morning. Uh, perhaps a good way of saying it 
is that our intellect, your intellect, my intellect, will shape and present these spiritual realities in a way to convince someone, just like Apostle Paul. Yeah, so if I may say, then, you know, our example should be Apostle Paul. He's 100% spiritual. He's 100% very uh, affectionate person. And he's 100% very intellectual person. But what? All his intellect, emotion, his will, all are what? Controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's how you and me, we live, you know, our Christian life. Okay. Next. Scripture as apology. Scripture as a whole. It's apologetic books. The Old Testament itself is full of apologetic material, for example, prophecy, etc. You know, Vantair, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, that we are going to learn. Uh, like to hearken back to Adam and Eve in the garden for examples. Always refer to Adam and Eve. That is the beginning of our ap apologetics. How does God argue after the fall? How, God the, the, how does God reason after the fall? From that time on, it seems the truth is argued for in a similar fashion. Always, you know, if you read Noah or Isaiah, what you know, Isaiah keeps saying, God says, come, let us reason together. You know, Isaiah chapter 1, God says, come to me. Let us reason together. No matter how, you know, red your sin is, I will make it as white as snow. Let's reason together. That's apologetics. Isaiah 41, 21. To idol, idolater, idolaters, set for your argument. Okay, you present your argument. And I will defend it, or I will, you know, reason with you. Ironically, by God's grace, the false apologetic fails on its own grounds. Yeah, we will learn later on why this unbelieving reasoning is always falls short of the uh, uh, truth. That's how we analyze this unbelieving truth. The humanistic thought, be it philosophy or intellectual argument or scientific uh, uh, argument, doesn't matter, whatever, everything, right? Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 14, verse 1 through uh, uh, 4, in response to either letters, who wish to inquire of the prophet, God says he himself will be answered. How is this apologetic proof? Ultimately, by God's own redemption, apologetic reversal. Okay. Let me stop here and interact with you. Okay, uh, first, uh, Soklatu, when people try to uh, attack your gospel, when you share the gospel, then how you uh, reason with the person usually? Just, you know, roughly. You try to argue with him or you just share the gospel or you do apologetics. I cannot hear you. I don't hear you very clearly. Oh, uh, something, something's uh, wrong with your. 
audio system. Try again. Hmm. I don't hear you. Okay, go ahead. Hear me or not? Okay, I hear you now. Okay. Seems like when sharing the gospel, someone is attacked. I think it's better to share and to say the reason to explain all about something or the thing that we share, especially if it's dark or night. So I think it's important to share and to explain the detail of that. Have you ever have experience of that, you know, while you engage in yeah, yeah. sharing the gospel, you end yeah. up in an argument. Uh, actually, every year, we're still in the, the, the among the community as well, and it's they worship it like the elders and other things. So when we just share the gospel, it seems like, yeah, it's, it's not arguing, we just only end in our sharing programs. Because if we just say our God is something like that, they, they, all, they will also argue with us. So this is better to just be honest. Okay. Uh, Celopo, Celopo, uh, can I ask you the same question? When you engage in a, a conversation with some people, you try to share the gospel with the person, but end up in argument, you know, uh, 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 shouting or, you know, become argumentative instead of persuasive or you know, sharing the gospel in good fashion. Yes. Can you ask again, sir? Oh uh, yeah, when you when you uh, share the gospel with other people, sometimes mm -hmm. we become, you know, argumentative. We argue. We quarrel. Instead of you know, uh, uh, doing apologetics, have you ever that kind of experience? No, I don't have it, but I just heard from the other. Oh. Yeah. So, as for me, it is not the best way to do that. Is I for my opinion. Mm. For, for the belief, you cannot force someone to believe, but you can encourage them to, uh, you can tell the truth and they encourage them or uh, do something for their like this, but you cannot force them to believe. If you force that, you will get only their physical, that they care. Yes, we believe, but in their heart, there is not reality. Oh, so that's that, great. That's yeah. great. Yeah. So that you to get their heart, you so uh, do this and then. Be patient and they have perceive right on them. Yeah, I tried many times before, in the past and came up, you know, end up in argument. You know, uh, uh, you're wrong, I'm right, things like that, you know, but uh, uh, yeah, many times in the past, but uh, nowadays very sad. Okay, what about you, uh, Sota Soto? Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I hear you good. Best, yeah. <laughs> Your mic system's best. I don't have the people who defend themselves to agree with my gospel. But mm -hmm. I have some of Christian mm -hmm. who disagree with me. Mm -hmm. So the best way to use the apologetic is let them speak first. Oh, good, good, great. And All then right. agree with them. All right. When they try to argue, mm. I let them speak. Mm -hmm. And then the best way to use is like uh, Apostle Paul used, be smarter than them mm. and use the word they sharper than their words. Mm -hmm. So when they come to realize that their words or their understanding 
is a little bit weak or wrong. Hmm. He can agree with you later. Wow, that that that's great. That is the really a, a you know guidance by the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible teach. But most often than not, we tend to go astray. You know, I, you know if I have to uh, share my stories, many many times I said, you know, I started in good spirit, you know, loving fashion, but I ended up, you know. Try to defend because uh, one good thing about my uh, argument was, you know, I have a strong faith and confidence in the truth of the gospel and gospel only, right? But uh, in a negative sense, to the hearer, I sound very offensive. I sound very exclusivistic, very argumentative, you know? So nowadays, the more I get older and the more I become, I guess, you know, you say smarter or a gentler, I try to listen first more and more, okay? And that is the approach that this uh, apologetic course is teaching, okay? All right, that's good, guys. Yes, professor. All right. Go ahead. Here, okay. Uh, something that I really want to ask questions about this oh, kind sure, of sure, things. Sure. That's a good time. Yeah. In my church, mm -hmm. things like one of the church members shared the gospel to the non believers. And uh, he talked too much about the gospel and also said some things very strict to other believers, other non believers. So it's the kinds of Becoming, when he shared the gospel and say that your God is not good, my God is the great, my God is the best. So you have to watch my God and because my God, my God is the God of all creations. He just said like that. So it's a kind of he defends uh, his religious, but the problem is it can make the, the community or the people, those who listen to his preachings, they feel very angry about that so what's the way you response in it that way yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exactly what i used to be <laughs> yeah 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 you know, it's in, awkward, sense, you know uh, in, in a good sense he's so you know confident in in the uh, power of the gospel but on the other hand you know it it closed the hearts of so many other people you know and they never want to deal with that person yeah so that is why again you know, you just heard a a, a sota soto a, a saying. That's a very good approach. You know, in the beginning we listen, listen, and then we gradually analyzing. You know, with that kind of a, a worldly view, a world view, or thought view, or life view. Always, it cannot come to the uh, one good conclusion. Because it's on the one hand rational, on the other hand irrational. They cannot come up these two uh, opposite thoughts. But on the other hand, you know, gospel is because our God is a what? In immanent God, but at the same time transcendental God. So in triune God. We can harmonize. We can have a balance. That is the uh, truth of the gospel. You know, yeah. So we, as as we learn more and more, we will come to that. Okay. Thank you very much. Very quick conversation. Let's keep going. Uh, ex Exodus seventeen. You know the Israel people wandering in the desert thirsty, etc. In a relatively short time, they have forgotten God. I've forgotten God will provide for them. So they rebel against Moses. And Moses take it to God. And God's response is, bring the elders and the rod of judgment over here by this rock. That is, let's set up a trial. The people who ought to be judged are the people of Israel. But I will be on the rock and be judged for them. 
when you beat the rock, water will pour forth. That is why in the New Testament, Apostle Paul says the rock is Jesus Christ. Right? God hit, instead of God hitting his people, the Israelite with rod, instead, he hit the rock with the rod. And the rock is Jesus Christ. Instead of crucifying you and me on the cross, God crucified his own son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. So that Jesus be judged instead of us. That is the essence of the gospel, right? So this is a great picture of God redeeming his people. Hey, before I forget, I'd like to just add one more thing about what you have said, what I have said. You know, our purpose is what? Sharing the gospel, God's love, you know? So always we treat people with the feeling of love. You know, we should love, whether he's Christian or unbeliever, we should love them as if they're my own body. That's what the Bible says. So always in loving fashion, loving attitude, loving mind, we approach them. Then we will lessen, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, lessen the, uh, what is it, uh, antimony. We will lessen the uh, uh, hostility. But still, even if, you know, with our own love and with our loving heart, that's what Jesus did. But still, we are bound to encounter a lot of hostility and rebellion. You know, so we have to always keep that in mind, okay? This is a great picture of God redeeming his people. Establishing a new position of truth. God, the just accuser of sin, has a sin against us, uh, has a case against us, but in his mercy, he brings the case against himself, against Jesus Christ, that we might be released. Wow. Hey, guys, you know, what an amazing uh, gospel we have. You know, even though I encounter this kind of passage yeah, thousands of thousands of times, still, every time I read, I encounter this kind of message. I'm so thankful that God is God of mercy. God is love. You know, the fact that God loves you and me, like wretched people like us, and forgive us of all our sins. Not paying any cost, but paying the cost of himself, sacrificing his own son, Jesus Christ. The point, we don't need a verse or two with apologetics in it to justify the task. Apologetics are already woven into the very fabric of scripture. Scripture as a whole itself forms a kind of apologetics. Two ways of looking at it. One, constitutionally. What is scripture? A covenant rule, arrangement, which is something of a constitution for God's people. Mount Sinai is constitutionally the organization of a theocracy, Israel as God's people. What is scripture? Yeah, let me repeat again. Two ways of looking at it. First, constitutionally, and the second, individually as a box. How you look at the uh, scripture, okay? Scripture as a whole itself forms a kind of apologetic. Constitutionally, what is scripture? A covenant rule or a covenant arrangement, which is something of a constitution for God's people. See, uh, let me see. Let me see again. Uh. 
you, I guess you almost forgot this uh, uh, chart. Do you remember this chart? <laughs> okay, look at this. This is all covenant arrangement from beginning to end. See? What is covenant? Covenant is a kind of a contract between God and his people, between God and us. What kind of a promise we made? The first, you know, before the fall, is covenant of works. Don't eat the forbidden fruit. As long as you abstain from eating the forbidden fruit, then you'll have eternal life. That is the what? The sign of the uh, tree of uh, uh, life. Tree of life is a sacrament. It's a type symbolize the eternal life. That is the covenant of works. You know, the condition is we should not, we must not eat the forbidden fruit, the fruit of no knowledge of good and evil. Now we failed. We all failed in Adam who violated the common, uh, common. As a result, you and me, we deserve 100%. You know, we deserve eternal punishment. But because God loves you and me so much, he introduced the covenant of grace. What is this contract? This contract is, okay, I'll do everything. Now you cannot do anything, spiritually speaking. So, for you, instead of you, I do it. The only condition is now you believe that Jesus, the Messiah. Okay? That's the only condition. That is what we call covenant of grace. Yeah, so from the four, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Jesus Christ, Apostle Paul, and now, you know, no say la po, so cla tu, so ta so to, and Lawrence me. We all under the covenant of grace. All we have to do is just believe in Jesus Christ all the time. When we we don't do that, then of course we fall into sin. Then what? We repent. That's why this is what. This is the covenant. All right. Now let's go back. Okay, what is the scripture? Again, okay. this is a covenant arrangement, which is something of a constitution for God's people. So Mount Sinai is constitutionally the organization of a theocracy, Israel as God's people. Yes, that's why we believe in the New Testament. Church is the uh, uh, God's people. In the Old Testament, Israel was God's people. In the New Testament, we are the God's people. All right? One feature of constitutional documents in the ancient Near East to lead up to the blessing, uh, curses, do's and don'ts with a historical prelude or preamble which identifies the participants. Okay, when you see it, there's a, some similarity in the ancient Near East, a contract, the kind of a, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, covenant engraved on the stone, in the stone, that is what? There is always blessings and curses there. Do, don't with historical prelude or preamble, which identifies the principles. I am the Lord your God. Yeah, in case of a, a vassal and uh, uh, a sovereign and vassal relationship, like Babylonia and uh, uh, Babylon and uh, uh, Israel, for example, what kind of relationship? Babylon was a, a sovereign state, you know, and the Israel was a vassal state. 
then the vassals, they should be obedient to the Babylonian king. Otherwise, they will be cursed. As long as they are obedient to uh, a Babylon king, then they will receive blessings. The Babylon king will protect Israel and Judah. That is kind of, you know, a covenantal uh, 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 a framework. And when you read Ten Commandments, what is the preamble or what is the uh, prelude? It says, I am the Lord your, Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Therefore, you shall have no other God before me. Therefore, you shall not have, a, you know, uh, idols. Therefore, you shall not uh, commit adultery. Therefore, you shall not murder. All this is because of this gospel. I am the, I will be your God and you will be my people. All right? So the Bible is apologetic in nature. It acts as a warrant for our belief. Okay, this is a constitutional nature of the a scripture. Secondly, individually, individual books, you know, uh, uh, 66 books of the, uh, 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 the Bible. The second way of looking at it is each book of the Bible to greater and less degrees is something of an apology. For example, the book of Genesis goes far beyond just saying, here's what happened. Creation for etc. are set in direct opposition against contemporary theology of times. For example, Babylonians thought we were created to be God's slaves. However, Bible says we were created in his own image. What a difference. There are some similarities, but the stark contrast is more evident. So scripture is constantly portraying itself and Israel in contrast to other nations. Hey, you think, hey, let's stop here right now and then just meditate uh, for a while. How amazing it is. You, you look at the uh, old map, old uh, near uh, ancient, near Eastern map and see, look around. There's a very small country, Canaan, you know, Israel. And Israel is surrounded by all Arabs, all, you know, Gentile people. And they all have a very similar religions, local gods, multi-gods. And somehow, only people of Israel, they have a monotheistic god. They have their own thing. Where did that come from? You think about it. Because we are the people, you know, all nations, there's no just completely isolated country in the world. But what about the Israel, ancient Israel? How come? They didn't have even their, you know, their own independent country. They, they were slaves of Egypt. But how come they have this kind of book, Pentateuch? It's a mind-boggling thing. Even just to meditate a little bit. Wow. How, you know, it came to be this way? You cannot explain otherwise. Then, as what the Bible, you know, says, it happened. How can? Another example, Book of Job is the other sin. What is the other sin? Justifying God in the face of evil. You know, some kind of in the midst of all this dilemma that we cannot solve ever. But still, we have to confess that God is just. And we are not. 
that's a theodicy. Job never finds out all the answers to his suffering. The answer God gives sounds kind of harsh. What, what was a, 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 a God's answer to a Job? All he explained was, uh, you know, how great he is. How powerful he is. He is the creator. And then there is the end of the job. You know, the answer God gives sounds very kind of harsh because he didn't directly answer uh, the questions of Job. So Job had come close to the wrong kind of answer. And so, therefore, God upbraids him, God rebukes him, and then God restores him. This is apologetics. You know, God doing apologetics with Job. And Job realized later on. We do not know exactly you know, how he realized, you know, God's a word. But at least we read, in the past, I hear your word, but now I see your word. He realized something he didn't realize before. That is how we come to know God every day, you and me. The God we knew yesterday, it's a little bit different from the God we know today. And God, we will come to know tomorrow, will be different from the God we know today. But God remains the same. The only difference is we, our understanding, the level of our understanding of God is different. The more we come to know God, the more we become what? Well, obedient, we become more joyful, we become more intimate with the living God. Another example, Ecclesiastes is another example. What is this? Ecclesiastes, it's just one word, without Jesus Christ, nothing is good. It is as if we are better off they not born, you know, into this world. Yeah, so again, ecclesiastic, you know, sounds in general very pessimistic. The conclusion is very clear. Everything apologetic. God lives, and whoever believes in God, he'll do well no matter what. Another example, even some of the Psalms are apologetic giving reasons to praise, theological questions, etc. Yeah, this morning I read uh, the Read the Bible, you know, the, the uh, website that I gave you, the Gospel Coalition. And it is, uh, today's uh, message is uh, Psalm 1771. And it talks about, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, David getting old. You know, he's now old age. He's not at his 40s. You know, at his 40s, those surrounding countries dare try to attack or influence uh, uh, Israel because Israel was so powerful. And King David was so young and so, you know, uh, 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 militarily superior. But now he's getting old. And a lot of people try to interfere and attack, and even without and within. That's why he's, uh, you know, in that psalm, he's uh, 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 pleading to God, Lord God, help me. Help me. You're my power. You're my protection. Yeah, <laughs> and because of my old age, you know, I felt 100% with him this morning. You know, yeah, that's right. Even though, you know, anybody, everybody uh, abandoned me because of my, you know, uh, weakness and everything. And, you know, I'm getting uh, weaker and older, you know. 
Because God is with me. He's the one who gives me, you know, ultimate meaning. Yeah, so whenever I think about that, I always wonder how can unbelievers live without God? Look so, you know, a cheerful. Because Bible says their fear of death. That's why they try in every possible way, try to avoid discussion about the topic of death. That's what uh, Dr. Carson is saying in today's, you know, uh, with the Bible. All right. Another example, prophets reason with people. See above, for example, you know, prophets 100% apologetics, you know. Another example, what about the Esther then? It doesn't even mention God. It talks about the preservation of the people of God by the hand of God working providentially. Even though it doesn't mention God, you know, the, the work, God's work of providence, working through people, through situation, through a circum, so overwhelming. We are bound to kneel you know, uh, our knees and praise God. Okay, now let's stop here and take your, uh, anything you want to share, uh, let's talk about it. This is more important time for me. Uh, Sota Soto, would you like to share something? Do you have a question while we do? Or if you have a you know, different opinion, then let's talk about it. If you agree with the uh, uh, discourse teaches, then you share why you agree, or things like that, you know, how you agree. Or if you have other questions, still, you know, we can share together. Your church matter, your personal uh, matter, doesn't matter. No one? Hello, hear okay. me? Okay. Yeah, I feel like the lunch is a little bit, but as a person working in the church, we still have any kinds of a challenge that we have faced. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we the Christians and living in a community that we have to deal with non-believers as well, because in our village, we have like a Buddhism, and animisms and Christianity in our village that we still live in together. Mm -hmm. And some of the non-believers, they just said to us like, oh, being the, a non-believer is not that much really a problem. Even you are the Christians, uh, even we are the, the non-believer, we we are like the rivers, like a river brook, a small river that one day we go back to the, the same ocean. So as a Christians, we just praise God. We do share the gospel to the church, inside the church and share the gospel to other people. And sometimes it seems like they are understanding the lanterns or the, the gospel that we share. But sometimes they don't really want to accept all those kinds of the, the, the better things, the good things about the, the gospel. Because they just say that, oh, everything is real good. It's dependent on us. So when we were Christians in these kinds of community, I think it's like it is really to stand for the truth of fact. And also we have to stand to share the gospel and still believe. And other church members, especially those who are weak in understanding the gospel, they just thought like other non-believers thought. Oh, uh, the religious is like uh, every religious good, so we can go to Buddhism, we can participate with other things. So in a community, I think, sharing the gospel or uh, learning, uh, giving or giving a lecture in about the, the Bible, I think it's really essential and it's really important in here. This is the kind of challenge that I just want to share. Yeah, uh, in my opinion, particularly in your situation, you know, the, the, the Myanmar is uh, almost 100%, you know, it's, uh, you know, the Burmese particularly, the Burmese tribe, 90, more than 95% are Buddhist, right? 
and yes, professor. They, yeah, they are majority. And uh, but one thing we have to know is uh, Christianity is is the only one religion. The only one religion. The essence is God's love. You know, all other religions do not have this concept of love. Of course, you know, the love we're talking about, worldly love, you know, the uh, man and woman love, those are all derivatives from God's love. Yeah, so the love is the essence of a, 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 a Christianity. And nothing can uh, compare to love. You know, not to mention God's love, the human love. Even, you know, we will be very uh, impressed by unbelievers who sacrifice themselves, you know, to love other people. Then we will be impressed and influenced. How much more people come to experience God's love, the only love, is unconditional, no reason, no string attached. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if I'm if I'm one of your people, then what I'll do is, uh, you know, I try to uh, show people, try to share the people God's love. Yeah. How? Yeah, I I I treat them very nicely. You know, I have to, if I don't show a love, God's love to them, then whatever I say will not have a power. Yeah? But if you show, if you show uh, the love of Christ in your life, in sharing something, you know, sharing everything that you have, you know, and your time and your energy, you know, for the sake of uh, 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 glorifying God, then sooner or later, people are bound to ask you, how come you're so different? You know, at that time, you, you, do, you don't have to say, oh, I'm different. That's uh, arrogant. That is not true love, you know, already. You share, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm worse than any, any other uh, sinners, actually. But because of God's love, you know, God accept me as his own son, sacrificing his own son, you know. That's why if I show some love, I don't know. But if, if you, you know, uh, uh, see some love from me, then that's God's love. And then you share the gospel. At that time, a lot more, a uh, lot more uh, effective. You know, I do not usually say it this way. If I live in Korea, if I live in America, then I will say, no, no. You share the gospel first. You know, no matter what. But your situations, I guess, are a little bit different. Because Myanmar or Karani tribe, they live locally, right? And they don't move around as much as uh, Americans or Koreans, you know? You know, we Koreans or Americans, in, in, in a sense, do not have a world and neighborhood. Because we so much move around and we do not, you know, for example, I live in an apartment, I do not know many of these, you know, people who live in the same apartments, we don't talk. Then how can you show your love? You know, whenever uh, uh, time available, then you share the gospel. And then you get to know them and you share the love. But in your case, you know, you do not move around. You get to know people, right? From early and then uh, until you die many times. Then what? It's the same as your family. You know, your family member know you, right? So before you say anything, they know what kind of person you are. And if you're a really trusty, uh, worthy person, 
then they will listen to what you say, your family member. Yeah, so it's very hard for you to evangelize your family in case they don't believe. Then how they are impressed, influenced by the way you live. Yeah, that's, I guess, same thing uh, uh, to uh, your people there. Yeah, so what uh, Sukla too, you know, if we are different from other people, other religious people, then what comes out first? Love. Yeah, we have love, particularly God's love, the highest love, you know, unconditional love of the cross. So, you know, all this human uh, physical sacrifice we are doing is nothing compared to God's love shown in the cross. Yeah, so that's why, again, the bottom answer is the more we come to know God in a true way, the more we are bound to show our love, okay? Yeah, so that's my advice. But this kind of advice, actually, I, this, you're the first people. I usually say no matter what, in season, out of season, wherever you go, you show, uh, you share the gospel. Why? Because uh, evangelism is a sharing of the gospel. If you don't say that, and if you try to, you know, that you are the light and soul to the world, it will take all your life and still come short, come, come short, you know. But in your case, it's a little different, you know. It's like your family, right? So that's my advice, okay? Yes, thank you, Professor. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, Nose Lopo? Yes. You have anything to share? Yeah. These are most uh, places in our community. Mm -hmm. I find seven when I go when I went to the summer camp or uh, summer teaching to the Phillies, most of them are um, Buddhism. And then we have a child to sell the gospel to them. But they do not give us or divide us, but they agree with us, but they still do not believe it. Mm -hmm. When I go to share the gospel to them, okay, they say that, yeah, it is good and that it is a great opportunity or it is, yeah, a great thing. If they are changed, they want to believe or accept Jesus, yeah, they agree and they allow, allow, them, allow them to believe Jesus or baptize and become Christian. Yeah, they allow them. But for this, uh, then this, uh, they do not believe it. They do not say that, okay, you don't believe it. No, they just say that, okay, we are already old. So we will just be like our assistant. So we we will not chase our belief anymore. For our children, we give the opportunity to do whatever they want. So there is how should we do that? I'm not sure. And most of the old People are talking me to uh talking with me about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I love this class. You know, we open our mind and heart and share the, our problems and everything. And of course, I don't have all the answers, but just listen to you guys. That itself is uh, amazing. Uh, Sota Soto, you want to anything to share with us? Yes. Okay. I want to share about the mission that we miss you in our church. Mm. In my camp, the majority member of the religions are Christian and Buddhist. Mm. And then Take 10 years ago, the Buddhist people are very nice to be Christian. And when we celebrate the Christmas or we have a Wednesday ceremony or Thanksgiving in church, they come to help us and join us. But when they celebrate their they invite us. 
Mm. Without and Spurs, did yeah. They yeah. didn't invite us to worship together with them. They just called us to go and eat with them, and they were to serve us the food, only food. And they didn't call us to go and help them anything. And they prepared the different place for us, the special place for us that Buddha people are not there and in there. But I saw that non Christian John and the food and the, the things that they prepare for us are left over and they have to throw it away. And they allow their children to come and attack study school. But we the creature when they call us to join their ceremony or concert, mm -hmm. we go to us. And then year by year I realized that we cannot share love to each other and we cannot cross each other. And the community is more complicated and we work and we play our role and they play their role. We don't invite each other and we live like a different group in one society, like a diversity in unity. Okay. Uh... In my opinion, that is a matter of convenience, you know. The previous, uh, in the past, that is a better condition, but now it got worse. Yeah, now the things that you can show is, again, you know, the conditional love. When you, 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 you share your, you know, love of God in sacrificial way, then they're bound to open their heart. You know, and then we we uh, destroy the uh, dividing wall little by little. You know, so there's no just a, and this is it. No, no, no. It takes time, but again, like I share, the most uh, uh, important one is, uh, you know, you you show, you live in a loving way. You deal with them no matter what. You know, you love them unconditionally, okay? Then uh, God will restore some kind of a community. Of course, you know, even in the even old times, you're invited to their, you know, uh, a ceremony things. Of course, you're not, you shouldn't bow, you know, because it's, a, it's a, as if we bow before idols. We cannot do that. But still, we can show some kind of a respect you know, for their tradition and everything. It's a very delicate balance, but if you're full of uh, the love of Jesus Christ in you and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, of course, you know, Holy Spirit will guide you. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. All right? Okay. Uh, now, let's move a little bit more. Preliminary definition of apologetics. Various definition, you know, we are not sure so. Just to let me uh, quickly go. Apologetics is thinking out the implications of Christian belief in various fields of thought and stating them in such a way as to maintain a conversation with the unbeliever in the world and the unbeliever in one's own Christian soul. Okay. What about this definition? Okay, the positive one, the pros. It recognizes that Christianity really needs to apply to all walks of life. Recognize that apologetics is for us as well as uh, unbelievers. The contra, you know, the, 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 what, what is not good for, about this uh, definition is it doesn't seem to be a clear goal. Focusing more on the process rather than the end. Okay, the second one is task of apologetics is to state in the clearest possible form the objective 
rational grounds for our faith. Pros, call for clarity, rational, objective, and personal. Cons, to state sounds like it's just about saying it and then moving on. Okay. The third, <clears throat> apologetics may be defined as the application of scripture to unbelief and as such may be seen as a subdivision of theology, which John Frame has said. Pros, that we should be arguing from scripture has an evangelist evangelistic flavor. Note, comparison between apologetics and evangelism, like two overlapping uh, circles. Edgar, the professor, apologetics centered primarily in persuasion, argument, whereas evangelism is centered primarily in proclamation. I don't want to sharply divide, you know, uh, into this way. When you engage in evangelism, at the same time, you're doing uh, apologetics. When you do apologetics, at the same time, you have to be in the spirit of evangelism. Otherwise, you know, neither of, uh, of them are uh, really gospel, uh, the, the biblical, you know. It's lacking something. So, in my opinion, uh, we don't make sharp distinction between evangelism and apologetics. A contrast seems a little bit clinical. Application, scripture to unbelief rather than the people. Two purposes of Christian apologetics. The first is defense. The second is to communicate Christianity in a way that any given generation can understand. It's a Francis Schaeffer. You, are you familiar with this uh, theologian? All right. Pros views the task as a defense, culturally relevant. Cons, yeah, Francis Schaeffer is uh, also the, uh, a student of Van Ter, Dr. Van Ter. A cons doesn't really define it. It just talks about purpose. And another one, apologetics is the vindication of the Christian philosophy of life against the various forms of a non-Christian philosophy of life. That's Dr. Van Ter's uh, uh, definition. The positive one is recognize that faith is a philosophy that works its way into the very cracks of our life. Tom vindicates a little more positive than defense. Recognize that there are many forms of unbelief. Cons? Yeah, it, it doesn't say, because this is a course about uh, of uh, Dr. Van Til, but I say, yeah, the average people, just uh, 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 normal people, are not very familiar with the word philosophy itself, right? If the people hear the word philosophy, then they think it's kind of a, a transcendental or you know metaphysic uh, realm. So in that sense, that's not very uh, intimate or close to us. Ethics and apologetics as a disciplines at the boundary of theory and practice take the results of the other theological disciplines and return them to the constant uh, to the to the concrete life of the believing community pros again takes advantage of other fears and recognizes community aspect focus on action what about the uh, uh, op, you know, uh, uh, contrast? It doesn't say. Yeah, the reason we go, you know, all this way is that the more we hear this kind of thing, the slower our brain will form. You know, even though we cannot pinpoint what apologetic, you know, uh, definition is, but still we have a more concrete uh, 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 ideas now formed in our brain, all right? 
that is the reason that we are going through. Okay, now more practical way, developing a Christian worldview. This is very important. You know, whether people are aware of it or not, we all have a, a worldview. Whether this is a biblical worldview or anti-biblical worldview or you know primitive worldview or more than 21st century scientific worldview, don't matter because no human being come out of a vacuum, right? We have a tradition, you know. For example, you guys just a, not independent person standing alone. No. You have your parents, your grandparents, and after after the you know, all these kind of a, a things inherited. Look at this. What is original sin? It came from Adam, our first parents, and still we all have it. You know how powerful it is. Okay, so developing Christian worldview. That's why it is not easy. For a person to change radically, even if we, you know, uh, that person really born again Christian, still we change very slowly. Why? Because all these baggages that we inherited and we experience and we think every day, it form our worldview, right? So little by little, we uh, destroy unbiblical worldview and replace it with the, a Christian worldview. Basic orientation, what is a worldview? How does the scripture really speak? Contains all we need to know for faith and practice. But this does not mean it contains all that can be known. So when it is silent, is it because those areas are out of bounds or rather because it expects us to work out those things for ourselves deductively? Again, uh, so when it is silent, when, when the scripture is a silent, is it because those areas are out of bounds or rather because it expects us to work out those things for ourselves deductively. Of course, this second one is our task. To do. That's why we are learning apologetics now. You know, if you, if you come to know God more concretely, then you will have a more capacity to apply the knowledge of living God into your daily life. You, it will help your ministry, it, it will help your social life, it will help your family life, you know, everything. Okay. The first person is Abram Kuyper. You know, uh, last, uh, last year I sent you, you know, the Calvinism, uh, what is it, the lecture on Calvinism. He's, he showed the whole world Christian view you know, why this Christian view, particularly Reformed Christian view, is so uh, biblical and so powerful that it actually changed and influenced the whole world. Abraham Kuyper. So people will call him here, he's the main figure of neo-Calvinism. Okay? Became a believer out of theological liberalism. German critical method methodology. He became a Christian when a simple peasant woman in his congregation witnessed to him. They share just a simple gospel. Founded a Christian newspaper called The Standard, spoke of faith integrating with real life. Yeah, later on, you know that he became the premier, prime minister of Holland. More than anyone else in modern times, he is responsible for giving us the notion of world view thinking, lectures on Calvinism. If you have time, reread it. If you haven't, then reread the lectures on Calvinism. We don't have to endorse 100% what he's saying, but 
you know, the junk, the main uh, uh, frame, uh, we will agree. Mm. He felt that at the root of every surface manifestation, for example, art, politics, business, etc., etc., there was always a spiritual issue. So bottom of everything is a spiritual issue. Yeah, you don't have an objection to this one, right? Because you and me, before anything else, we were made in God's own image, who is a spirit. So you and me, we are made as a spiritual being. Whether we are aware of it or not, it is at the bottom of all human beings, okay? The identity of a human being. That's why if people do not believe in Jesus Christ and born again, then he's like an animal, you know, in a very uh, uh, rough expression. So the Bible, although not speaking to every particular instance, provides all the necessary ground rules to deduct deduce and to apply. Scripture, however, provides lots of examples of application. For instance, in giving of the golden rule, Jesus follows by telling us not to cast our purse before swine. Yeah, you, we have to be uh, wise, you know, the more we we become a spiritual person, then of course, the more wisdom God will give. Then even, not only outside people, even in, in our congregation, you know, there are some people who act like, think like a swine, right? I'm not talking about, you know, to disrespect these people, but spiritually speaking, that's what the Bible teaches. Then what? Then it's no use of you sharing the gospel with this, this kind of people for the time being until the Holy Spirit, you know, open his or her mind. That's why we have this kind of a, a rule. Even Jesus said, don't throw your jewel. You know, the, the gospel is a jewel. Gospel is not cheap, you know, a thing. Don't take it lightly. So this colors and shapes the actual command. So the Bible is not a textbook. Okay, but last word is, then how you deal with this kind of people? You know, still you love him or her to the end. Okay. That is the power you and me, we are endowed from God. No ordinary people, natural people can never do it. Why? Because out of their own uh, good uh, motive, still good, but that has always self-righteousness at the bottom, right? So there's always uh, the boundary that you try to hit that boundary, then you can no longer tolerate. You can no longer love that person because your self-righteousness, the level has hit the maximum. So you burst into hatred or anger, you know? Why? Because all your self-righteousness, you know, accumulate to that point. But you and me, we should be, we shouldn't be like that because you and me, we are indebted in the love of God. So the more the love of God accumulates in us, what? The less we become. We become selfless. No matter how much you show your love and share your love and sacrifice your love, still, what? You will not exhaust that love. Why? Because the source is from God. Source is God. God is an infinite God. So if we rely on God, then we can show that kind of people, swine people, still to the end, we can show love. Right? That is power of the gospel. So this colors and shapes the actual command. 
So the Bible is not a textbook, but it gives us the essence of worldview thinking. Now, Kuiper, in his enthusiasm for worldview thinking, sometimes took things too far. Late hundreds, 1800s, gave a lecture series at Princeton that has had a tremendous impact on Christian thinking. Late 1800, a Gable lecture series at Princeton that has had tremendous impact on Christian thinking. You already have it, right? So anytime you can. In his chapter on art, he says some things that are good and true, but some go too far. Yeah, so you have to be descriptive in reading that. Okay, you don't have to endorse 100% of what he said. Why at the Reformation were the Calvinist branch is seemingly unenthusiastic about the earth? Where? Why we, 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 we learned this thing? Because Edgar, you know, the professor who taught this apologetics, uh, his major was uh, art in the Harvard University, the, uh, Professor Edgar. That's why. He's dealing with art here. Why at the Reformation were the Calvinist branches seemingly unenthusiastic about the art? Where? Because worship is such a crucial moment in the believer's life that it needs to be as spiritual as possible. But outside of worship, we should be as artistic as possible. So it seems that he's drawing a false dichotomy between spirituality and the rest of life. It's almost like he's trying to hard to say we have a world view should not mean that we have all the answers. Edgar is pleading for humility. Yeah. So even though we have the Bible and our theology is good, still we have to be humble, you know, because everything is given by God's grace. <laughs> but hey, you guys know uh, Muhammad Ali? Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, the the heaviest uh, uh, weight champion, the boxer. Yeah. yeah, you know what he said? He said, oh, it's very hard for me to be humble because I'm too great to be humble. <laughs> yeah, he's a Muslim, but that's what he said. You know, I always, uh, uh, <laughs> that kind of remark reminds me of a, you know, a human, uh, uh, identity. Yeah, it's really hard. When you're great, it's really hard for you to be humble, you know, like Muhammad Ali. But it's better for you to be humble than you to be great. If you're too great, if you think you're a great person, then you cannot be saved. That's why. <clears throat> Edgar will present all kinds of reasons why we should have a Christian worldview, but at the same time to hold it lightly, not being worldview imperialists, <laughs> saying dogmatically, dogmatically, this is how Christianity should be applied in all these situations. We need to recognize that the application of our faith may take different forms in the lives of different believers. Yeah, that's why particularly you and me, we are Protestants, right? That means we have many, many, you know, thousands of different denominations. And we have to always respect, you know, other people. At the same time, we shouldn't lose our confidence in our theology. You know, that's a very fine uh, path to uh, tread on, very delicate balance. On the one hand, you should be confident, 
what you're taught is really biblical. But at the, on the other hand, you should be very uh, 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 careful not to be arrogant and remain as humble as possible. How you do it, the only answer is again, you know, you receive and control by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That means our own nature being modified to be cared the minimum and Jesus Christ be maximized in our heart. Then we lose our old nature. We lose our old self. That is the only way you remain as a as a humble and you remain, you know, 100% obedient to God's word. And you're so confident in the power of the gospel. Okay. <clears throat> Edgar strongly believes in the sufficiency of scripture, but also that it doesn't try to micromanage a lot of details. It leaves it up to us to figure some of these things out. All right. What about recent history? Okay. Uh, again, let's talk about a little bit about what we have covered. So, Claude, too, you want to share something? Hey, is it easy for you guys to be confident in, in the gospel at the same time remain as low as possible, you know, humble being? Is it easy or difficult for you guys? So, Clato, you're the first. I, I think <laughs> it will be a bit challenging for me. Yeah. Okay, let's share. You know, share the gospel and be uh, actually we when share the gospel, we have to be very humble or something like that, right? And uh, this is a kind of uh, a challenge for us as we come across with the lanterns that we're talking about sharing the gospel. And in our church, in our, in here in my community, we have an amount of we like it. in Matthew five sixteen. It's talking about therefore we have to share the light so the people will see of God and glorify Him. And this is something that we are bringing and we are exercising in our community. So sometimes you know, as we talk, we talk the talk, but have to walk the walk as well, being humble and. Uh, uh, at some point, you know, it's really challenging for us as well to practice in those areas. <laughs> All right. But you have not shared your personal experience yet. Any yeah, okay, yeah. I'll pass on this time. Okay, so Tasato. What about you? Big patience is the hardest thing that I have to try. Because the day when I know myself as a human being, I used to hear my mom suggest me to practice more patience till now. So, and another thing is, I'm not good at speaking to the strange people, and I cannot speak nicely to the people who I don't know, and I don't have a strength or make a good friendship with the stranger people. So it's hard for me to share gospel to the young people. Yes, so Tassoto, you know what? The fact that you know that you, you are not good at, you know, uh, speaking to uh, uh, strange people, that itself is already a plus, positive thing. You know? <laughs> I... Yeah, and then, you know, yeah, I like to share the thing. You know, actually, by nature, I'm very introvert person too. But when I share the gospel, all of a sudden, I become so extrovert because I have tons of things to share with them. 
And before I engage in conversation, I always, you know, talk to myself, okay, I have to, you know, shut up my mouth and detention and listen as long as possible and digest and try to uh, understand, you know, that person as much. But if that person says some unbiblical things in the midst, then I interrupt and boom, you know, I share. Bah, 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 bah. And after conversation, I always be in repentant mode. Oh no, you know, I did it. I I I I made mistake again and again. Wow, that's you know, 20 years, 30 years, even nowadays, can I have that kind of trait? Yeah, but thank God. God God changed people's tear. That's why I am, you know, even though I have that tendency. Still now, I can be more uh, uh, patient, you know, and try to understand that position by God's grace, of course. Okay, Lucello Paul. Yes. That's for me, yes. There is very challenging, and the most important part for me is perseverance. Because when I say to God's uh, gospel, I like if we just someone, just we say to them one time to that return, it is enough for me. If they say, uh, they already know what they say, don't believe it, I don't to say to them anyone, just what, just they pray for their ladies. So I had to be more perseverant to stay share the gospel thing they believe. I think, think they have said. You know, at your age, you're struggling with this kind of issue. That's already a good sign. You know, I am three times uh, as old as you guys, and we are struggling with the same thing. That's already very good, you know, in your uh, position, right? Okay. Mm. Yeah, praise the Lord. Mm. Just a minute, how much we... Uh... Okay. Wow, these things are, we have 12 minutes. All right, let's go a little bit more then. Uh, recent history, uh, basic idea of biblical worldview stems from the fact that God sees all. Genesis, he saw all that he made and it was very good. Yeah, so we start from here, God's goodness, you know, because God is good God. So when he created all things, it was very good. Carries a notion of judgment, discernment, evaluation. We too, by analogy, can know the world. We do it in recreative ways, in uh, uh, independent ways, based on God's revelation. This is a Bantil's uh, phraseology that he says, you know, we are not creative we are recreative ways because we we follow creator god okay and our knowledge is not direct knowledge like god's knowledge but our knowledge is kind of indirect knowledge so we know by analogy okay we'll come to know this kind of concept uh, more clearly later on although we cannot know exhaustively because we are not God. We can know truly. The things we know, we can know truly. That's why we can know uh, the content of the Bible. The greatest opponent to worldview thinking today is what? The claims of postmodern tradition. We learned last, last semester, right? A little bit about postmodernism. What is the characteristic of postmodernism in just one word. Everything it relativizes, right? It abhors the word absolute truth because there's no such thing in their dictionary, all right? Everything relativizes. Any such truth claim will not only be false, but will also be dangerous, imperialistic even coerce it. Other major opponent to worldview thinking is a dualism. Yeah, dualism is a, a stairwell, you know, 
after you know uh, 80 uh, 2000 years it was a very uh, rampant in early christian church also dualism founded in the middle ages when it was thought that to attain the highest level of spirituality and to heaven we needed to have access to someone who lived in the same upper story the only people who were called were those in the ministry. If you called to the ministry, you gave up all earthly goods, devoted life to prayer, service, etc. Okay, this is within the church dualism you're talking about, particularly in a uh, 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 medieval church. You know, the, the uh, uh, mother of a Catholic church, they try to separate. One is sacred, the other one is a what? A, a secular. It's a dualistic ideas. No, 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 that's not biblical ideas. You and me, we are both the secular and the sacred at the same time. That's why we, we say we live in the world, but not of the world. But these people, you know, uh, the medieval church people, you know, the more sacred you feel, then the more you have to be separate from the world. That's why they go to monastery. They become a monk or nuns, right? To be more sacred. That's your own dichotomism. All right. Yeah, so you gave up all earthly goods, devoted life to prayer, service, etc. Are you familiar with Thomas Akempis on the imitation of Christ and the renunciation of the world? Yeah, this book so famous, you know, millions of people read this and, you know. But what it says, the basic idea is a dualism. It is good to be close. Calvin and Luther, etc., attack this idea. First, everyone is called summoned by God onto the kingdom as his child. Everyone is called to their task in life, whether it's farming, it's God-given occupation. Not only ministry, not only bishopric, not only nuns and you know monk, but also the farmers, doctors, whatever. You know. So is a cleaner. Everyone has a God-given Occupation, same word as clause is calling, the same. Nothing is inferior, nothing is superior. Yeah, this is amazing revolution at that time. You know, so when uh, 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 Luther said, you know, we all have a uh, old priesthood and also, you know, all, all people have a God-given, you know, uh, occupation. That's kind of a revolutionary ideas at the time, shattering this dualism, all right? So the beginning of the modern world view thinking starts to develop at this point. There is still a lot of dualism in the church also, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you know, when I, when I share the uh, chart, that's a dualism. In a, in a sense, you know, in the church, either you are legalistic or anti-legalistic, antinomian, you know, indulgence. No, no, there got to be a, 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 the, a Christian way. That is what? The gospel life. If you're in the gospel, then you, you don't become a uh, legalistic. You don't become uh, anti-legalistic you become gospel-like, all right? That is the only way. Worldview thinking says there is something comprehensive about being a Christian. It impacts literally every aspect of life. This is a good thing. That's why, Lord willing, I like to share, particularly if you guys are, are teachers and you take care of some, you know, uh, uh, children or junior, senior high uh, uh, school students. We have to teach them and discipline them in every aspect of life, 
not just the Bible, but you apply the teaching of the Bible into everyday life. I'll share with you when, you know, Lord, Lord permits. There are all great details I'm preparing uh, uh, to share with you now. All right. Groen van Prinstera. He wrote a very thoughtful critique of a French Revolution. You know, at the time, lots of people said, you know, French Revolution is very good. No, no. You know, uh, from a gospel point of view, this is very bad. Because this is kind of proclamation that God is dead. Human beings are God. That's a French Revolution. Of course, it destroyed many undesirable, you know, in the name of Christianity, uh, the corrupt church, the medieval church has to be destroyed. In that sense, it's good. But he went too far on the opposite direction, saying there is no God. All right. While there were many understandable reasons for the French Revolution, 1789, there were nevertheless deeper, more spiritual reasons, neither with God or with the law. They try to eliminate everything about God. Trace this picture motive back to early French thinkers like Voltaire. Paris was the intellectual capital of Europe at that time. Lots of cafes, dramas, and journalism, etc. There was a deep sense of foment. The big redemption, I don't know this word, you know, maybe misspelling or something. Uh, the big reduction was that the enemy was anything in the ancient regime. The government, Roman Catholic Church, everything at that time, you know, were dominant, became the enemy of the people. That's why revolution took place. Create a human death machine, that's guillotine, guillotine, you know. They introduced more cruel uh, 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 thing to execute people. Enemies of the revolution were paraded to the guillotine and executed, including Louis the Sixteenth and his wife Mary Antoinette. You know? Revolution had a negative enemy, but not much of a positive program. Ended up with a religious substitution of an old regime for a new one. So what? From that time. There's instead of faith, reason took the uppermost place in human thinking. All right. Kuiper read Prince Toro. Yeah, Prince Toro was a you know a elder. He's a before Kuiper. So Kuiper read Prince Toro's books, started to explore the whole idea of under, underlying themes behind this type of thing. His lectures at Princeton were originally about the history of Calvinism. Later, he fleshes out Calvinism as a world and life view. A German word, Weltanschauung, that's a life system, carried a systematic aspect or systematic notion. This word was picked up by idealist philosophers beginning with the Kant, you know, he's a, he's a kind of a, a father of a transcendental method. Like the French revolutionaries, they have substituted their own religious principle called the absolute or the idea. Kuiper rejected this strongly, saw these folks as a pantheist, even though they say, you know, Christians, but actually their principle is a, a pantheist. Nevertheless, he liked the idea that there is an interconnectedness between everything. He felt Christianity was perfectly positioned to explain his connection. So Kuiper had a tremendous impact on Christendom. Okay, we finish right here. Uh, it's uh, 10 o'clock. Any question?
No cell no pole. Mm -hmm. no one friend. more question. Yeah. All right. What is your question? Um, I have no more questions. Oh, you have no more question. What about Soclato? You have a question or something to share? No, no, not a question. And I'll just have very well. And I, I think it's really benefit for me because I have no come across with a lot of things as a pastor or something in the church. We still, I still know more about things to deal with the non-believers or to deal with my church members who is always angry with me about their faith and not to belong to other non-believers. Yeah. All right. That's good. You know why this course is very good for us now? You know, among our church members, they say they believe in Jesus and they're born again Christian. That's it. And their worldview remains the same, never changes, you know. That's not a, a true faith, right? If you truly believe Jesus as the main center of the universe, then of course your worldview, everything begins to change, right? And this is, uh, first of all, it changes our worldview in a biblical way. And then we influence you know, our congregation in that way. Okay? All right. All right. So we, we stop right here. Uh, the Celopo, would you like to finish in prayer for us? Yes. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, we would like to say thank you for your blessing. And everything that you had done ever in our life. May your name be praised forever and ever. Father, thank you for these periods that you be with us, that we understand on your word, how to do or how to share the gospel. Please inspire the with your Holy Spirit and guide us to continue to share the gospel to non-believing and also to be a faithful Christian. Bless our profession who teach us and bless all of his family and fulfill their need. Please bless all of us in this time in order to fill with your Holy Spirit and your power then we will have the shadow of Christ in our life. Please be with us, guide us. We come in our life, in our time, in our way, in your hand. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, may God bless you and see you next week. Yeah, with thank the you. Holy also. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Now, All right. Okay.